So many pretty pictures on the internet, all just a click away. When is it okay to use those images in your presentations and projects? What, you mean there are rules? Hello, I'm Bart Everson, creative generalist here at the Center for the Advancement of Teaching and Faculty Development at Xavier University of Louisiana. In this presentation, I'm going to give you a quick rundown on digital media and intellectual property rights. We'll talk about some of the common pitfalls that uh, you should avoid, and we'll show how to find images that you can use with impunity. So let's just take a moment to look at this fancy title, Copyright Copyleft. That's what I'm calling this. If you remember only one thing, oh, and sorry, I do have to show you this legal disclaimer. Okay, uh, the basic rule, if you remember only one thing, unless you know it's okay, it's not when it comes to using other people's images. Unless you know it's okay, it's not. Don't worry, I'll come back to this at the end. So. Let's talk about some of the basics of copyright. When is a work copyrighted? Well, it's really the moment that the pen leaves the paper. As soon as the artist finishes the drawing, it's considered copyrighted under US law. You know, copyright protection exists from the moment an original work is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So for a drawing, this fixation occurs as it's created on paper. And Please note, the creator doesn't need to do anything else for the work to be protected by copyright. That protection is automatic. It's immediate. The copyright gives the creator exclusive rights to reproduce and distribute and display and create derivative works based on their drawing. Now, you may hear people talk about registering with the U.S. Copyright Office. Well, that's not required, but it does have some additional benefits, uh, particularly if the creator ever wants to sue the pants off of somebody for violating their copyright. Okay, well, what's the difference, though, between patent and trademark and copyright and some of these other terms that you might have heard? Copyright protects original works of authorship, literature, music, art, etc. that are fixed in a tangible medium, They're like books and recordings. So copyright grants the creator exclusive rights to reproduce, distribute, perform, and display the work and create those derivative works that we were talking about. Copyright protection is automatic upon creation. Generally speaking, it lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. Trademark, on the other hand, that's to protect symbols and names and slogans that are used to identify goods or services, to distinguish them from others. They're supposed to prevent consumer confusion about you know, the source of the products. And uh, they can be registered with the U.S. Patent Office, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and they can last indefinitely if they are renewed. Speaking of patents, patent protects new inventions or discoveries. Uh, they grant the, grant the inventor exclusive rights to use, to make, to sell the invention for a limited time. It's usually 20 years from the filing date. Patents have to be applied for in the same office. They cover inventions that are novel, useful, and non-obvious. But we're not going to get into patents. We're not going to get into trademarks. I'm just wanting you to know how they're different from copyright. And there are other situations. Uh, public domain, fair use, creative commons. Let's talk about some of these. Let's talk in particular about the public domain which we're representing here with the slogan, No Rights Reserved. Um, and here's a, a painting, a famous painting that I think you might recognize. Starry Night. It's in the public domain. Why? Because, <laughs> in short, non-technical terms, because it's old. That's why. Now, there's basically four ways that something can enter the public domain. Because it's old, in other words, the copyright has expired, and there's a lot of complicated details. I'm not going to get into it. 
um, there's if it's messed up, if somebody messed up, like uh, mistakes are made, a failure to renew a copyright, uh, there's also the possibility of voluntary dedication, that the author or artist explicitly wants their work to be in the public domain and says so, and dedicates that work to the public domain. And of course, government work. In the United States, works created by the United States government are considered to be in the public domain. So Starry Night qualifies. It can be used to make derivative works. For example, this dress. This dress is an example of a derivative work made from that famous painting. And it can be done because the painting is in the public domain. It can be done without asking anybody for permission. But it's a little more complicated if we can think about for a moment, what about the photo of the model wearing the dress? Is the photo of the model wearing the dress in the public domain? No. It was, if it was copyrighted using traditional means, then we'd have to get permission. I would have to get permission to use this photo in my presentation to be completely above board. Instead, I'm simply going to give attribution here because this photo was published under a Creative Commons license. Creative Commons. What is that? What is the big idea? Well, it's the idea is to extend copyright. It allows the creator of a work to allow others to use that work while the creator retains some rights for themselves. And this has been going on since 2002. So I can use this image because it was published under Creative Commons. And it was published using a Creative Commons attribution share alike 4.0 international license. So I have to give credit. That's attribution. Uh, plus, my presentation has to be published under a similar license. A share, that's the share alike part. And yes, there are a lot of variations. We're not going to get into every different flavor of the Creative Commons license. But we will talk a little bit more about this in a moment. I wanted to quickly, though, mention the concept of fair use. Yes, you can also use copyrighted works without permission, Creative Commons or otherwise. Uh, just plain old copyright images. You can use them in a work without permission. Here's an example. Educational use. A professor using copyrighted images in a classroom presentation to illustrate the concepts being taught. But there are limits. So what if she publishes her presentation for the whole world to see? Well, <laughs> that's less likely to be protected by fair use. Above all, for something to be considered fair use, you've got to conform to the four factors. The four factors of fair use. Well, let me note a couple of other things, by the way. You'll notice she's using, the professor is using an image in this presentation, and you'll notice that she has given attribution for that image that she's using. That's good practice. And that also helps make the case that it's fair use. Uh, and you'll notice as well that I'm going to give credit to the photographer because that's also good practice. The photographer who took the picture of the professor who's used, making a presentation that uses the photo. Oh, are, you, you, are you with me so far? OK, great. So let's get into these four factors of fair use. I think of them as a purpose, nature, amount, and the market. Uh, we'll get into each one of these. First of all, we encounter the purposeful pixie, a sprightly character who asks, why dost thou use this work, mortal? This impish being cares not for your mundane reasons, but seeks transformation and education. If your use brings new life or knowledge into the world, the pixie may bless your endeavor. But beware, commercial pursuits may sour its mood. Next. We meet the nature nymph, a fickle spirit 
who judges the essence of the copied work. This ethereal being favors facts and information, finding them as free as the wind. But oh, how she cherishes creativity. Pluck too many petals from a fictional flower and you may incur its wrath. Okay, and just in case this whimsical approach is a little bit obscure, let me decode a little bit of this for you. The nature nymph, that refers to the nature of the work itself. When I'm talking about the fickle spirit who judges the essence of the copied work, it just refers to how this factor, the second factor of fair use, how it, uh, how it examines the characteristics of the original work being used, the nature of the work itself. When I talk about how the nymph favors facts and information, that means that factual works, you know, things like news reports, scientific data, historical information, uh, these are more likely to be considered fair use than creative works. It's because the law recognizes that facts themselves cannot be copyrighted, only the expression of those facts. When we talk about the nymph cherishing creativity, this indicates that highly creative or imaginative works you know, novels, poems, artistic images, well, they have stronger copyright protections. And using creative works is less likely to be considered fair use compared to using factual works. And when I talk about plucking too many petals from a fictional flower, uh, that metaphor suggests that using substantial portions of a creative work, like copying large parts of a fictional story, it's more likely to be seen as copyright infringement. And that's actually a good segue to our third factor. Looming large is the amount arbiter, a meticulous giant who weighs your use on cosmic scales. The, this colossus cares not for quantity, but quality too. Take a pinch and it may nod in approval. Grab a handful and you might topple from its favor, but beware, even a morsel, if it's from the heart of the work, may tip the scales against you. Finally, we dive into the depths to find the market mermaid, a siren who sings of economic tides. This aquatic oracle peers into crystal balls seeking ripples in the market caused by your use. If your actions threaten to drain the original work's value, her song may turn to a tempestuous roar. So, taking all four factors into account, in short, it's complicated. When in doubt, you should weigh the risks against the benefits. Now, I promised that this workshop would also talk a little bit about something called copyleft. The basic idea is to use copyright law to ensure that creative works remain free, free to use, free to modify, free to distribute. The core, principle, the core principles are to grant freedoms. The copyright, copyleft grants the users freedoms, freedom to use, to study, to copy, to modify, and to redistribute those works, pictures, let's say, but also to preserve freedoms. The crucial aspect of copyleft is that it requires all derivative works to maintain the same freedoms as the original. And uh, there's also a legal technique at work here. Copyleft uses existing copyright laws to enforce these freedoms. Essentially, it turns copyright on its head to promote openness. And one example of that is the Creative Commons share alike license. Sure, you can use it as long as you share what you've created under the same terms. Other licenses include the uh, new public license, well, there's various new licenses, the Mozilla public license, the free art license, uh, the Pixabay license, for example. I should mention that, you know, um, well, which one of these is not actually copyleft? That's right, it's Pixabay. Pixabay is not copyleft because it lacks reciprocity. It's actually more permissive for reuse, but not for resale. So it's best described as Permissive, a permissive royalty-free license with some specific restrictions. And I single out Pixabay because I've just recommended it to a lot of people over the years. 
a lot of people use it. It's a huge website uh, that provides royalty-free images uh, that can be used without attribution. Uh, but you can't sell what you make. You can't resell the photos, I should say, uh, from Pixabay. So there, it's actually more restrictive in that way. And a few notes from my own personal experience. I have been publishing photos on the Flickr platform for a while. Over 10,000, well over 10,000 photos published uh, so far. And I publish almost all of my photos using a Creative Commons attribution license. It's the most permissive license that Creative Commons has outside of actually dedicating something to the public domain. It means that anybody can use any of my photos to basically do anything as long as they give me credit. That's why it's called the attribution license. Now, over the years, I've found that even though people can use my photos without asking permission and without paying me, that there's a lot of times people actually do want to, they want to do just that. They, they want to, um, they still want to pay me, they still want me to sign a contract just to make sure. And that's great. Uh, but and then conversely, a lot of times people will uh, use my images without any attribution at all. And that leads me to Pixie. Pixie is a, another platform, a service that uses a lot of artificial intelligence to scour the internet looking for photos that match a particular set. So it looks at my Flickr photos and roams around the internet looking for matches with those photos and finds uh, that allows me to investigate who's using my photos and with just a few clicks I can see whether or not a person has given me attribution and when they don't I can have Pixie start harassing them sending them emails phone calls uh, threatening letters that make it sound like there could be some legal action and in fact they can actually go there and get lawyers involved and, and make a lawsuit, but most of the time that doesn't have to happen. A lot of peep times, either uh, we can't reach anybody and it doesn't go anywhere, or conversely, they cough up some dough. To the point that this has become a nice little extra source of, uh, of income for me. Just enough, just enough that I do have to report it on my taxes every year. So. I'm abundantly aware that it's important to make sure the images that you use are okay and that you're not going to get in trouble. Oh, and here's an example for Pixie. If you want to see an example of an actual photo that's been flagged, this is from Oregon State University uh, on a blog. They're using a photo that I took here at Xavier showing a recycle bin next to a trash can. Oh, no, that wasn't at Xavier. That was at New Orleans City Park. Uh, did they give me credit or not? Should I threaten them with legal action? You know, as a rule, I, I try to go after um, big profitable operations and not other institutions of higher education. But you never know. Now, what to do with all this situation? How do you find images that you can use with impunity? Well, there's a number of different ways. First of all, you can do it yourself. That's right, do it yourself. Take your own photo uh, or make your own drawing. These are a couple examples. I took that photo, I made this drawing. Just to, It doesn't have to be fancy, it's just a sketch on the back of a napkin, right? Uh, scan it and you can use it with impunity. Uh, on the other hand, you might not be able to f generate your own, so you can look on the internet. You can use internet searching tools. Google has a really good image search. Uh, if you go in to do a search on Google and you look under the images tab, you might not have noticed, but there are some further tools down at the bottom. Actually, they only appear if you click the tools button. And then there's something called usage rights. And you can search for things that are filtered by Creative Commons licenses or not. The, what we're seeing here 
is what shows up when you do a search on XULA that is not, you notice the check mark says not filtered by license. And here's that same search looking only at Creative Commons images. Very different kind of thing. We don't see the Xavier logos now. We do see things from Flickr and Wikimedia Commons. So that's one way. And of course, another way would be to go to specific platforms that have a lot of images on them. Wikimedia Commons. Uh, there's Picrill. There's Pixabay. Uh, Flickr has search tools as well that allow you to constrain to look only for Creative Commons uh, licensed photos. And I want to note uh, at this point that my colleague in the Xavier Library, Corinne Seister, has prepared a, a much better list on a resource that I'll tell you about in a moment. So once you've found an image that you know is OK to use, of course, don't forget to give credit. So here's a photo I took. In order to give credit, it can be as simple as just putting my name there at the bottom. Or I could include the title of the work as well. It's not absolutely necessary, but it's kind of nice. Uh, I could even include details uh, of what the license was. For example, CC Creative Commons Attribution. That's CC BY. Uh, that's helpful to me if I put this in my presentation to remind me of the license that I found, uh, the photo under. It can also put anybody who's finding my presentation on the internet, it can alert them to the nature of that license. So that's really would be the best practice, I would say. And of course, another way of doing it would be to put credits at the end of your presentation. Uh, I'm practicing what I preach here. The images that we saw here, I'm going to account for anything that I didn't account for on the individual slide is accounted for here. So you should consider clarifying also the terms by which you publish anything. If you're publishing something where it can be accessed uh, by the world, what's the terms that you're publishing it under? Uh, this presentation is pub licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0 International License. That's the default policy that we use here at CAT. And I can even put a little logo. These things are available out there to represent that in graphic form. If you ever see that, that's what it means. Creative Commons, attribution, non-commercial, share alike. Finally, remember the basic rule. Unless you don't know it's OK, it's not. And that URL that you see at the bottom, that's a link to our wiki. I've created a resource page on our wiki. It will link you to the library's resource page that I mentioned previously, as well as a few other things, like these very slides and uh, this video, all indexed right there on our wiki. So once again, I'm Bart Everson, Creative Generalist at the Center for the Advancement of Teaching and Faculty Development. It's been my honor to share some ideas with you about copyright and copyleft. I hope that you found it useful, and I thank you for your attention.